up five minutes of your time to acknowledge the accomplishments of some of our students, something that makes us as faculty very proud. And so I want to start um, with in a, a ceremony. However, before I start, I notice that I, we have um, a few guests here who don't normally come to our lecture series. One is the director of the Rhode Island Sea Grant, who is helping uh, to support, co-sponsor this evening's guest, Dennis Nixon. And we, and we also have our associate dean, uh, Nancy Eaton, from the College of Arts and Sciences. She's also here. I want to thank them for, uh, for attending. And I would like to say that before we do the awards, we have, a, we have a changing of the guard in the student chapter of the RIASLA student chapter. So that this year's president is going to be Pavel Fernandez. Just stand up, pa Pavel. <laughs> our, our vice president, Romeo D'Andrea, stand up, please. Secretary will be Aaron Norrison, <laughs> and our treasurer is Kelvin Wong. I want to thank you all for taking this on your responsibilities, and hopefully next year will be a super year like this year. Uh, our department awards, we have two awards that are outside of the RIASLA, the Rhode Island chapter, and I just want to uh, not everyone is going to be here because some people have jobs or they're coming from Providence. But I would like everyone to note that there are six awards. I will start with Rhode Island ASLA Merit Awards. Two of our seniors, Alexandra Ludis and Beau Doucette. Just come up here, please, and stand up here. <coughs> We have a camera person, but we, we, we will have a camera because I have a camera. You don't. <laughs> this, is the first, this is the first time we're doing this, so that we're a little bit, yeah, and you have to stand out of the, the light of that. You have to stand where it's dark. Where your face is not in the That's right there. So those are two Merit Award winners for 2016. Yeah. Yeah. We have two honor award winners. Um, I'm not sure if Victoria is here. I hadn't seen her. But Victoria Boxdale is one. And the other is, is, is Anton Almeida. Yeah, Anton is here. Come up here. We have two other awards that don't have certificates right now. They will, they will be acknowledged in different ways. Um, so I want you to know what the awards were. One is an award from the University of Rhode Island for academic excellence, which is a very special award. And uh, our award winner for 2016 is Josh Forgery. To come up here, please. Graduation weekend, uh, all of the academic award winners, each department gets to select one person, and they are honored. And it's quite an, it's quite an inspirational presentation because you've got every department's people with uh, their story and uh, accomplishments. And the last award, I don't know, I didn't see Kai Ying here. Kai Ying Yang is also a senior in landscape architecture, and she's this year's Landscape Architecture Foundation National Olmsted Scholar Award winner, which is really great. Her picture is going to be in Landscape Architecture magazine uh, next month, and they will, at the national meeting next year, all of the award winners from around the country, the 69 schools that offer the awards, are all going to convene 
in New Orleans, which is where the meeting is, and there will be a special ceremony for them at that time. And I want to I want to thank all of you for participating <coughs> and for putting in your best. And I would say to those of you out there, work hard. There are there are rewards, and this is a really this is the first, and I hope of many more award ceremonies. So thank you. So thank you for your contribution. <laughs> uh, we have one other award. I don't, and I'm not going to embarrass anybody. No, it's not going to be an embarrassment. But I want you to, I want everyone to know that we have a special honor this year uh, for Professor Simeone. Ooh, ooh, ooh. He, I know he doesn't want it. Uh, Angela was was honored by receiving URI's highest teaching award for the entire university, the Teaching Excellence Award. And I want him just to come up. And <laughs> to say some words besides our speaker. Yeah, I'm going to make it real brief. I want to thank the Academy. <laughs> <laughs> and let's get on with this. <laughs> I think you should get a free puppy. Yeah, get a free puppy. Popcorn. So, uh, I want to thank our sponsors, the College of Arts and Sciences, the Bartlett Tree Experts, the Rhode Island Chapter of ASLA, and the Gatano and Pascalina Faello Memorial Endowment, in addition, uh, the Rhode Island Sea Grant. Uh, thank you so much, because that's how the lecture series can bring people like our speaker this evening to speak to you. Last but not least are our reception people. Romeo D'Andrea, Kelvin Wong, and Pavel Fernandez. You can wave. They are the ones who buy the food, they place the food out there, they put the don't, don't eat it until you're a landscape architecture student, sign on it, and then they help clean up. So thank you for the entire year and for everyone. Thanks so much. Now this is normally when I tell you who our next lecturer is going to be, but that's going to be in September. So I'm not going to tell you, we're going to get right to it. Tonight we are really very pleased to have Catherine Sievit Nordenson. I'm going to just call her Catherine Sievit, an associate professor of landscape architecture at the City College of New York. She's a principal uh, doing her own work with Catherine Sievit Studio, also of New York City. A very interesting background. Everyone has different backgrounds, and hers is. I asked, why do you have two architecture degrees in addition to having? a Master's of Architecture from Princeton. She has a Bachelor's Degree of Architecture from the Cooper Union, and a Bachelor of Science in Architecture from the University of Michigan. And it makes total sense why she did it. Um, anyone want to know why? So after she got her degree, and she was trying to decide whether to go to graduate school, which ultimately she did, she said, I want to get, I, I think I want to go to graduate school, but I don't have the money. Cooper Union is a university, uh, a school in New York, that if you are accepted, it's free. And so after doing her weighing this and that, she went there. She said, wow, this is such a cool feeling place. And I like what they're doing, and I like the education, and I like the environment. I'm going to go there. And she still was able to get her master's in architecture from Princeton University. Catherine's a registered landscape architect and a registered architect. She received a Rome Prize uh, in architecture from the American Academy in Rome, a Fulbright for research, and a Graham Foundation Award for Advanced Studies. She also received design awards from the AIA, American Institute of Architects, New York chapter, and the New York Design Commission for outstanding public projects for which she was nominated. Um, or she was also nominated for a Cooper Hewitt National Design Award in Landscape Architecture. A scan of her projects will indicate, or will show anyone, 
uh, that her focus is on water, waterfronts, rivers, coasts, edges, coastal materials, resilience, and she's got projects in Queens, Brooklyn, Manhattan, New York, St. Louis, New Orleans, Shanghai, and let's go along and illustrate her interests and successes. She's exhibited work at RISD, the Architecture Biennale in Venice, and at the Van Allen Institute and the Museum of Modern Art in New York City. She's more, she's got, he has more than 40 articles published in papers and journals, and her work has been reported on in Landscape Architecture Magazine, Sheep's Head Bites, The Architect's Newsletter, New Yorker, The Architectural Record, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. She's lectured on climate change, adaptation, and ethics, marsh restoration, structures and coastal resilience, social resiliency, and she has a book on Roberto Burley Marx. Uh, when I read the article, The Storm We Don't Know, which was a cover article in Landscape Architecture last uh, May, I said, I would like to have her come to URI. I didn't know her at the time. I just called her, and she was most gracious and willing to come to URI to talk to you. So it's great pleasure to ha that I have to welcome Catherine Siebeck. much for having me. This is great. I had a really nice afternoon with Will. I got to see your school, meet some of you. Um, so thank you so much for having me. It's a real pleasure. It's my first time um, actually stopping in Rhode Island. I've passed through, but I've never gotten off the train. So it's a delight to be here. Um, and I hope that, I think that uh, my interest in the watery parts of the world will probably speak to some of yours. It's very, uh, you're obviously an extremely coastal state. Um, as is New York City, we have 520 miles of waterfront. So uh, part of my work recently has been working on many of those miles. Um, I'm going to talk to you tonight about one project that's taken about two years to complete, and we're still working on and advocating for this work. Um, the project is called uh, Shifting Sands, Sedimentary Cycles for Jamaica Bay, and it's essentially it's a... Um, a uh, research grant that I received from the Rockefeller Foundation and worked on as a part of a greater project, the Structures of Coastal Resilience project, uh, with three other universities, all of us working with um, recent graduates from our institutions on sites near our universities. So Jamaica Bay, if you've ever flown into New York City, you probably you may have landed at JFK Airport, in which case you flew over Jamaica Bay and may have seen some of those marsh islands. Um, here you see my student Tyler in the bottom right corner sort of uh, with his drone, which is taking this picture, and you can see the skyline of Manhattan behind uh, basically the top of the slide there, and a marsh that's under restoration by the Army Corps of Engineers to your left. Um, but what's also very interesting about that bay is it's much more than a field of water with some islands popping up, but it has an incredible benthic community, meaning the, the critters that live on the bottom and the creatures and the life that it actually um, hosts. So to us, it was very fascinating to think about the bay as a complete entity, not just uh, a surface and a plain that's, that's not land, but rather to think about it as a kind of a volume of water and the basin in which it's, in which it's held. So Structures of Coastal Resilience was a grant given to us by the Rockefeller Foundation, which also funds 100 Resilient Cities. It funded the RBD Rebuild by Design competition recently. Um, they gave us money to basically look at four different sites, Back Bay and Baymans, along the East Coast in areas that were affected by Sandy. So you're seeing here the four sites. One actually was here in Rhode Island, Narragansett Bay, which was looked at by Harvard University team. Um, Princeton University looked at the Back Bays of Atlantic City. And University of Pennsylvania studied Norfolk, Virginia. Um, City College, we were essentially, we were looking at um, Jamaica Bay. We were proud that we were the only team that could take a subway to our site, which was kind of great. Yes. Oh, I'll take one. Yeah, I was trying to use my mouse, but I'll. Sure. Yeah. Can you not hear me? Is this even on? Yes, it is. Is it this one or this one? This is the one. Hello? Oh, it's off. I don't think it's on, yeah. It was working. It's not I can try and be louder. Let me just put the thing over here, and then I will leave you. Something is crying. Oh, here, I'll put it on the side. Fine. Hold on while we adjust these technical uh, lines. I think it's on, right? Yeah. On, Am I stepping on something down here I shouldn't be? Yeah, Probably. Coming from right here. 
you may or may not be able to. Can you hear me? Is this a little better? No, this is the same. Yeah. I get the guy. This thing is me. No, that's wrong one. We might have to just shout. I'll just be louder. Yeah, I'll use my teacher voice. All right, people. So, <laughs> here we have a beautiful image by the Army Corps of Engineers. This isn't how we usually draw, but I love their graphics. Um, it's really showing you the intensity of the storm impacts on the Atlantic coast, um, from basically from Norfolk to Maine. This is part of the region, the North Atlantic Division, um, over which it has its purview. And you can see the purple, very high, the most impact from the storm, from Hurricane Sandy. Um, and we were actually kind of working right within the most intensely affected part of that um, uh, landfall of the storm. Um, New York City here, here's Jamaica Bay. The airport's this little orange block here. And what you're seeing is the hurricane evacuation map from pre-Sandy, so there was a zone A, B, and C. Um, and the interesting impact of Sandy was really the impact on the back bays uh, and the unexpected flooding that occurred in places like this, the back of the bay. So, as you can see from this map, this was considered Zone B before the storm by um, the emergency management organizations in the city. But in fact, it was, it was flooded so extremely that, in fact, a lot of the people back there felt really taken by surprise. So, often the impact from Sandy was essentially water pushing into those back bays with the surge from the storm and then being impounded and unable to retreat. So, there was a number of, uh, a couple of tidal cycles by the time the water could actually drain out of the bays. Uh, so what happened at Jamaica Bay was very similar to other uh, areas along the East Coast. The interesting thing here is because we're in the urban footprint of New York City, we also had incredible large populations of people who were quite vulnerable um, that were impacted quite greatly. So here I'll zoom you into, um, this is called the Hindcast or the, the area of flooding. Everything you're seeing in blue is flooded terrain. Uh, and we took this focused view essentially on this embayment. The Rockaway Peninsula is here. Um, there's one community that lives on these marsh islands called Broad Channel, Channel right in the middle. Uh, this is JFK Airport. This is a former um, airport called Floyd Bennett Field. It was the first municipal airport from 1924, but it was really used for the mail. Um, and then along the back of the bay are a number of communities um, that ring that back bay. And here's Lower Manhattan is here. This is called the Upper Harbor and the Lower Harbor, and this is Coney Island, just to give you a little bit of geography if you haven't been to New York. Um, and here's the aerial view. So you can see these marsh, ma marsh islands that essentially uh, populate the center part of the bay. So what we were very interested in this idea of islands and marsh was to think about um, changing edges, changing coastlines. So what you're seeing on the top left are a whole series of former um, coastal edges, let's call them that, or how they had been mapped through history, as well as how some of those channels had been dredged. These are tracings from nautical charts, historical nauti nautical charts from NOAA. The bottom right is a fabulous aerial image from 1924, a series of photographs prior to the construction of JFK Airport, so you don't see that here, or um, what became Floyd Bennett Field, but essentially you're seeing a lot of these dendritic channels of water flowing down the watershed through the bay and out to the ocean. And we were fascinated by this idea of wetland or land that is neither ground or water, but somewhere in between. We are very compelled by these images of this, uh, this marshiness in the bay, as well as by these forces of tide and current that were starting to create these tendrils of sand um, deposing along the edges of the islands as well. So there was an idea of these natural forces that were occurring within the bay just through tide and current. Um, I'll probably be showing a number of images like this tonight, and they're all taken by um, Don Ripe, who lives in Broad Channel, that one inhabited island, and has been photographing the bay for many decades, and um, who shared all of his slides that had many of them damaged and sandy, which we scanned. Um, and he's often, he did a number of these helicopter overflights in the, in the early 90s um, to examine the marsh health. So what we started to look at was, in, in fact, what is the area of impact, or what impacts the bay. So this little model that you can see down here is essentially a topographic model that shows just the uh, catchment area, or the watershed, of the part of New York that drains into the bay. And actually, you can see it's quite extensive. Here's the bay, but all of this is that area that catches water and comes down into the bay. Now, because of the, our urban footprint, essentially that's a sewer shed, meaning that everything is piped. 
um, stor storm water and um, sewage essentially goes through pipes within these areas called sewer sheds and everything within a sewer shed ends up at one of these uh, water pollution control plants or water treatment plants. And then that cleansed water, which still is very high in nitrogen and other nutrients, is still flushed through the bay before it gets to the ocean. Um, the other fascinating thing about the bay is that it doesn't all belong to New York City. It did once, but in 1974, when the city didn't have much money, they basically gave it to the national parks. So the dark green areas here are showing you what the national parks owns. It's part of Gateway National Recreation Area. And the lighter green is city parks. Um, here along the Rockaway um, Peninsula, this is in fact a lot of city beach. And then these parks that are on the back side of the border of the gift was essentially the, the Belt Parkway, a highway built by Robert Moses um, in the 1930s. Um, part of this project and why we were working carefully with the Army Corps the entire time was they also had a grant at the same, not really a grant, but they had essentially been um, commissioned by Congress to create a two-year study of the areas impacted by Sandy. That's the map I showed you earlier. Um, and we were timing our grant to actually move along with theirs and look in closer detail to these sites along the East Coast. Um, they were looking at the entire range, the entire reach of the North Atlantic land area, but we were looking at four different sites. Um, interestingly, they have a long history at Jamaica Bay. Um, the image on the top is essentially, it's from 1964, so now I guess that's over 50 years ago, um, a project called a Flood Control Project from East Rockaway Inlet, which is here, to the Rockaway Inlet and Jamaica Bay. Um, and essentially they were looking at a series of proposals to protect the bay from storms and surge following a couple of pretty bad nor'easters, those are the storms that come down from the northeast, as well as a couple of recent hurricanes as well. So their plan one, shown here um, and detailed in this little graphic on the bottom, was to essentially build a tall seawall along the ocean front, cross over the island with a dike, another seawall along the back, and to close the inlet with a storm surge barrier, as well as smaller levees to create a continuous line of protection at the outer edge of the bay. Um, there were also two sort of value engineered versions of this plan. One was this plan two, where essentially the project just captured that eastern end of the Rockaway Peninsula, and plan three that you can barely see, but it was, it was very small. Um, it was diking and small closure structures for these inlets, uh, tributary inlets at Howard Beach, which is a historic neighborhood in the northern part of the bay. Um, but then this is picked up again in 2012 after Sandy as part of the SIRR report by New York City, which was under Bloomberg's administration, um, with the exception that the storm surge barrier was shifted slightly to the west to capture what is now Breezy Point and cross over to Manhattan Beach, which is the tail end of Coney Island. But the theory is the same, and this is what we started to question. The notion is that if you protect the outer edge, you protect everybody inside. Um, however, we wanted to think about that a little bit more um, holistically and to think about certainly the environmental impacts of such a move. Um, but also the, the idea of a binary like that, you're either wet or dry, has severe consequences in, if it should fail. And we know from history, um, even as recently as Katrina, that systems fail. Um, since 2014, of course, this is a map that I'm going to show you, uh, another Army Corps map. There are a number of projects that are being done by the Corps within the Bay. So not only have they continued this work on Jamaica Bay, not necessarily, they never did execute the Hurricane Protection Plan from 64, but they did continue to do a number of projects, project-based, meaning small little parts of the Bay, essentially working on one little inlet at a time in terms of coastal restoration or cap restoration projects. These are shown in the green back here, often in partnership with the city. Um, they still continue to dredge at just the entry to the bay. They don't dredge within the bay anymore, but for navigation for essentially the, the boats that come and give fuel to uh, the JFK airport. And very interestingly, these three projects for um, marsh restoration at the center of the bay, pretty innovative um, environmental restoration projects by the Corps. Um, so we wanted to think, this is a more recent map of the same area of impact where they've now started to add in something that came out of that North Atlantic Coast comprehensive study, the two-year study of the Corps, called um, Natural and Nature-Based Features. What might you ask is an NNBF? Well, in fact, the Corps didn't really know, and so that was part of what they were trying to explore with their um, comprehensive study, but essentially an NNBF is green infrastructure. So this is the Corps really trying to grapple with the idea that maybe in addition to the concrete structures they generally use and extrude along our coastlines, there might be something else to be learned from nature. So. Um, they started to create a kind of catalog, which we've illustrated here, 
which includes such things as salt marshes, barrier islands, dunes and beaches, maritime forests, and even um, oyster and coral reefs. So they wanted to look at natural systems, understand how they operate, and transform them into what they call features um, to be used in tandem with some of the other grayer forms of concrete infrastructure that tend to be their domain. So this was very interesting to us. Another interesting thing that came out of the early work in the, the core's comprehensive study was this, um, this great graphic, which is essentially a little GIS um, layer exercise where they started to look at this question of risk. Um, the core no longer speaks about flood control. They talk about coastal storm risk reduction. So they've changed their language, as they often do, and create a glossary to teach everyone else what that means um, whenever they produce a report. But what we thought was fascinating that their composite risk was created by three laminations of plans that analyzed environmental, infrastructural, and social risk. But these were weighted in the sandwich, 80% on infrastructure and 10 and 10 on environmental and social. So you can see where the core's values lie. It's to protect the infrastructure, but they've basically marginalized the environmental and social risk factors. So for our team, it was actually quite interesting to think about, well, what if we only looked at those things separately to see what's going on at Jamaica Bay as, an, as a case study? So here, um, the first map is really looking at where is um, infra infrastructural vulnerability. Here's the hindcast again. And if you look at the things that the Corps considers infrastructure, such as roadways, evacuation routes, you can see, in fact, yes, it's quite vulnerable in that there are only a couple of ways in and out of the bay. Um, but if you even expand that into looking to hospitals, schools, uh, fire stations, you really see that the infrastructure is clustered on the higher end of that watershed. And in fact, in the bay, there's very little, which also means in a time of emergency, you don't have much to rely on. Um, and of course, JFK is the big elephant in the bay in terms of the biggest piece of infrastructure that's there. Um, and here's an, uh, to give you a sense of the tenuousness of those roads and the rail. This is the subway line that goes out through the middle of the bay to the far Rockaways. Um, it is quite a tenuous place. Um, and then you have these strange juxtapositions of nature and culture or infrastructure and um, natural systems right next to each other. This is one of the runways at JFK, which basically takes off right into one of the largest marshes within the bay uh, marsh platform, which is Joko Marsh. The second thing we looked at of those three layers was the social vulnerability. So here, are these maps are showing us, we're just mapping people. We're not looking at topography. We're not looking at elevation. We're not looking for infrastructure. We're really just looking at numbers of people and what they're like. So population was the one constant in all of the maps that we looked at. So each dot here is representing 20 people. We used uh, 2010 census data for this uh, mapping. Um, here you're seeing race balanced against population, so you can see What's the makeup of these neighborhoods? You start to see things disappear. Breezy Point, one of the hardest pieces of um, the city that was hit and indeed with a fire as well after Sandy flooded and then a fire that the, the trucks couldn't get to, um, is a very sparsely populated area on the tip of the Rockaway Peninsula, uh, as is Howard Beach. So one of the more historic neighborhoods is very white and very under not uh, densely populated. But other places start to light up with um, more kind of ethnic diversity as well as population, Canarsie, and the Far Rockaways, for example. So we looked at what the core used as risk factors for uh, vulnerability, and we actually mapped those out separately, looking at single mothers, um, the, the elderly and the very young, those who don't speak English, and those below the poverty line. So this was also very interesting in terms of giving us a different look at the bay, not based on water and land or elevation, but rather, again, look at Canarsie with all of the people that are classed as socially vulnerable. And here's another one here. So these are the people that are most at risk in a time of storm. And again, we could delaminate our own layers as well to look just at the single mothers, just at the elderly who live alone. And thinking about those populations and where they are within the Bay was quite interesting. Things such as um, uh, some of the most active voices in the Bay are those who live in Broad Channel, a lot of environmental watch groups there, as well as in uh, Howard Beach. But they almost disappear from these maps. So it tells you that those communities are actually quite robust and strong. They don't have the same elements of vulnerability that some of the other places around the Bay might have. Uh, and the third and last of the three types of vulnerabilities that we looked at was the environmental. And so here, again, we're not looking at people or elevation. We're actually looking at species threatened and endangered, rare and sensitive ecosystems. And again, we find them all over the bay. So particularly the farthest uh, western end, sorry, yeah, the western end of the Rockaway Peninsula, the interior of the bay, the coastline edges, these are all incredibly sensitive ecosystem areas um, and quite vulnerable to any kind of impacts of infrastructure that might be imposed on the bay. 
Also here we tried a kind of tricky task of, of mapping where the threatened and endangered species are. Many of these are birds, so they do move around, but um, we know that there's quite a, po a plover population here at the Far Rockaways, which most community and um, environmental groups are quite aware of. Um, so this was interesting as well to think about where are their vulnerabilities that are, that are environmental vulnerabilities. And you can see again in Don Repay, some of his photographs show this collapse of the edge of salt marsh, this panning that's occurring in the middle of the marsh. Um, and also these interesting phenomena. This is a, the abandoned airfield that's part of national parks now. It's called Floyd Bennett Field. Um, and there's some novel ecosystems emerging at the northern part of that area, uh, kind of reverting to their former um, wet, wetland um, terrain. So there's these interesting freshwater marshes that are appearing um, in the north, what they call the North 40 area of Floyd Bennett Field. So what was quite fascinating is when you look at the social vulnerability, you see this kind of footprint of where the urban settlement is. And environmental is, in some ways, the perimeter in the middle of the bay. So when these two things merge together, you see this incredible juxtaposition of environmental and social vulnerabilities. But also that adjacency is very interesting because it means we have actually a quite robust and rich environmental um, possibility here in the bay that's right next to the people. And so you start to think about this idea of going to Jamaica Bay by subway, its accessibility, the fact you can see the city from a wildlife refuge. This is the former World Trade Center towers uh, with migrate, migrating birds at the, at the wildlife refuge in the middle of the park. Here's the Empire State Building scene um, beyond an 80-foot mound of garbage, which has been capped and is now being transformed into a park. So these are incredible juxtapositions. It's an incredible place to learn about uh, natural systems as well. So part of what we did with the project for Jamaica Bay in terms of thinking about resiliency was to think about systems. So it wasn't necessarily um, creating designs and renderings of beautiful restored sites and happy people, but rather to think about what are some of the strategies that one could use in this area that could help make the entire region as a system work more comprehensively and robustly. Um, so again, we broke this into three different typologies. Um, working kind of systemically throughout the bay. Uh, the, the, I'll start with the blue down here, flow and circulation, so really thinking about water quality and how water moves in the bay. We looked at what we call verge enhancement, which is the elevation of coastal edges, not necessarily at the edge, but pulled back often in a gradient fashion. Um, and lastly, what we called the Atoll Terrace Island Motor, which is a new strategy for marsh restoration that we hoped the core might start to emulate. So again, the three types are the flow and circulation, um, verge enhancement, or thinking about how to enhance infrastructure, particularly with an interest on that Belt Parkway by Robert Moses, and thinking about how that might be adapted to be part of a storm uh, resiliency measure. Um, and again, the marsh island restorations through this medium of the, the terracing. So I'll go through each of the, the typologies with a few images of some of the designs we proposed for some of those parts of the bay. Um, but you know, we have a, quite a comprehensive set of designs. I'm just going to show you one for each of the three types. Um, for flow and circulation, we also looked to natural systems which had experienced similar things under different circumstances, non-urban. Um, and this is quite interesting, the kind of typical overwash and breaching that occurs along these barrier islands. This happens to be at Fire Island, um, and it's an overwash breach at a place called Old Inlet, which had closed, but in fact, Hurricane Sandy breached that inlet again. Um, the Corps' policy is generally, generally to close any breach along the entire stretch of southern Long Island from Rockaway Inlet all the way to Montauk at the tip of Long Island. Um, in this case, because this was part of a national seashore managed by national parks, they let this remain open and they're still watching it. In fact, it's beginning to heal itself and close with sand being moved along with literal drift along the southern shore. Um, but with that in mind, we started to think about that's actually a healthy response to a disturbance. In fact, the exchange of ocean to bay water actually creates a more healthy back bay environment um, through a flushing mechanism. So we started to look at a couple of ends of the Rockaway Peninsula, this one being um, the furthest eastern end near Far Rockaways. We looked at what we called flow paths, or way that the water might move, or how one could guide the water to move in a particular fashion in the time of a um, storm or even extremely high tides, which tend to flood these neighborhoods as well. And we also looked at changing water quality by using um, mechanized flushing tunnels that would be below the grade of the island. Uh, farther to the west, we looked at two areas of low elevation. This is now in the area that's owned by national parks. Um, so there's actually no um, human settlement there. In fact, no one lives at this area. 
But we looked at what we call here overwash plains, or again, places that are like dry arroyos in the time of no storm, but during a storm, they would actually allow water to go in and out of the bay, trying to um, relieve some of that impoundment of water that we saw during Sandy that Bloomberg famously called the backdoor flooding. Um, so these were two strategies here. And so to go, up, go about this, we kind of took some cues from some early Army Corps work with modeling um, and created some physical models of the bay and actually imposed, uh, basically brought some surge into those areas. Here what we're doing with this uh, area at Floyd Bennett Field is creating two new channels at the north end of the um, Floyd Bennett Field to bring more water both in and out. And at Jacob Reese, again, looking at the um, questions of overwash at that area, we looked at the condition without any overwash plane created, and now we have gentle, kind of two-foot depression, and you start to see that some of that water immediately moves, and again, you get uh, what we saw as very important was the entry into the bay of ocean water, which comes laden with sediment, which then nourishes those salt marshes, which are so sediment-starved in the back bay. Um, this is that same area that you saw in the model. This is the um, um, Jacob Reese um, beaches, and here there's a 1920s deco beach house. Um, and a large parking lot by Robert Moses, probably big enough to be seen from outer space, but we thought we could probably make a smaller lot. Here's the parking now, and we have these two tidal inlets that are basically carved into that um, terrain that, are allow that essentially allow water to wash over if there's a very, very high tide or a storm event. Um, but we also include a berm in order to protect the residents of Neponset, which is basically the end of the kind of settlement of the Rockaway Peninsula. Um, before you reach um, farther to the west, two other small communities. So this is a, a berm, so a lowering as well as a kind of rising on the sides to create protective areas. And you're seeing in section a detail of that berm. And this is a, a building right here on the map, which is essentially, uh, it's an abandoned building now, but it could be retrofitted. It's a former elder care center. And this is the full stretch of essentially the very gentle depression of the, um, the section of the um, Marsh of the um, peninsula there in order to enable this overwash at this point. So you can see in this rather crude GIF, uh, movement of ocean to bay of these waters and they're receding in, time, in a time of surge or a storm. Now this is the, just for your um, geography here. This is, this is called the Gil Hodges Bridge. It's the one bridge in the site of the storm surge barrier that was proposed by the Corps in 64. So that's the one line of access from the end of the Rockaway Peninsula back to Floyd Bennett Field and the city beyond. So the second of the three strategies, the verge enhancement, was our, our nod to the, uh, the importance of the protection of infrastructure, but also how one could think about um, infrastructural protection in a way that was more robust. So really thinking about infrastructure as something that could be part of a more um, natural system as well as, and a gradient edge that allowed for more habitat. Um, so this is the kind of thing we were thinking about, how can um, built infrastructure start to serve as a barrier to flooding, potentially, in terms of the communities that are in the back. Uh, we did a lot of digging into the archives of Robert Moses and thinking about the Belt Parkway and its initiation. Um, it was inaugurated in 1940, um, and it was seen as this idea of a ribbon park that was also a parkway, a shoestring park so long it, that would basically wrap um, Brooklyn and Queens all the way from the Lower Bay up to the Long Island Sound. Um, and in fact, this stretch, the first part constructed, had its own um, bike path included. It's actually the first highway or roadway in the U.S. to actually include, as part of its comprehensive road section, a bicycle path. You can see the kids from the 40s and what they looked like riding next to the bay um, to, their, to our right, and the cars on the parkway there. But some of these early images were also quite compelling because you started to see um, that movement of sand, which is essentially what was happening here in this um, outwash plain of glacial... Um, moraines. So this is all essentially sand that's being moved, and what we're seeing here is the raising of the ground to accommodate the spring of those bridges that needed to cross all of these tidal inlets, some of which had been dredged in the 1920s further into the depths of, of Queens and Brooklyn. Um, but essentially you can see this mounding of sand in order to raise um, the landing points of those bridges. And we thought about how could potentially one use that idea of raising at the, at the, uh, at the infrastructural uh, zone of the Belt Parkway, but as a continuous line. Again, here shown essentially in the hot pink is the higher elevation, so we're trying to think about a continuous line of protection here along the Back Bay that would essentially start to achieve a flood elevation height um, suitable for a FEMA 100-year flood, 
but something that could be overtopped, and if so, a place for the water to go in that case. So here you're seeing, again, where we raised. Here are the two um, closed landfills, so very high elevation at these points. Uh, the Belt Parkway glides behind them, and here we peel off from the parkway at Spring Creek and Howard Beach and cross and tie up to high ground again behind the airport. So again, we're using the notion of thinking about a line of protection, but in this case, bringing it much closer to the communities where they actually need that protection rather than a singular big move or big fix out at the outer edge of the beach, um, at the Rockaways. So this is one of the bridges of the Belt Parkway at Spring Creek. This is the community of Howard Beach, um, and this is one of the sewage treatment plants. In fact, this is going out to the bay to our right. Um, and what we did here was essentially to take that high point of the bridge crossing, keep it high at 15 feet, and wrap that elevated berm around the community with small closure structures similar to that third plan of the Army Corps from 64, um, but with more of an idea of a natural gradient and series of um, um, environmental communities and plant zones that would be occurring along the elevations from the water to the high point of the berm that you see here in this section. So essentially we're moving from water through low marsh, high marsh, um, uplands, upland shrub, and even beyond the top of the berm into coastal maritime forests. So that can also act as an attenuator and buffer to any kind of surge that would overtop that berm. So again, here in this digital elevation model, you can see the, the brighter white is the higher elevation. This is the continuous um, berm wrapping along the back of the bay. Um, and here, it's essentially simulating a 100-year flood and showing how that would actually stop at that line um, again, sort of achieving some more friction from the run-up along the um, open spaces that are between the water and the high point of the berm. Now, the third and the final of these three strategies for the overall resiliency was to consider uh, methods of res restoring the marshes. And as I mentioned, the Army Corps has been doing this work, and three marshes have been restored within the bay. Um, very large projects, very big budgets, and a lot of dredge material, and I saw there was a a pinup today of an invented island, so I think that this will be right up your alley. Um, so we were really trying to think about how edges weren't necessarily fixed, but how you might start to harness some of the forces of sediment movement within the bay. And of course, the, um, the principle here is borrowing a little bit from what we see in the Netherlands with the sand motor. So essentially, this is a new coastal restoration technique that's being done in Holland, where they have a huge quantities of sands available in the North Sea. They place a large quantity offshore uh, and then that, that sand is distributed through the natural forces of littoral current. So essentially the force, the long, long, longshore drift force that moves along a coastline is distributing this sand. So they ha aren't actually placing it, they're seeing where nature might put it. Now, of course, when the Dutch say nature, they mean something very different than us, um, considering the constructed nature of their own environment. Um, but this has been a really interesting um, phenomenon to watch. We wanted to think about how could one adapt that coastal littoral um, phenomena to the back bay. So again, we're working in a back bay environment that has an exchange, a twice a day tidal exchange, ocean to bay, and it has some sediment coming in from the ocean. But we thought about how could one think about something similarly to the island, uh, to the sand motor in the, in the context of the island. So we started looking at atoll formations, um, which are of course composed of corals, and they also, like marsh islands, they can keep up with sea level rise because they grow on themselves, so they basically increase and uh, accrete on their own footprint. Um, we found these great drawings by Darwin of some of these islands, and we were compelled by this idea that many of them are not fully enclosed. So some of these um, have very open configurations at the exterior. We wanted to think about that. Um, this map shows you where the core has restored marsh. Um, essentially, Yellow Bar Hassock is our most recent project. Elders East and West were the first big ones they did, and then a f um, Big Egg was the first pilot they did with the national parks with thin layer deposition. But these were quite big projects. These black wall and rulers bar closest to this community in the middle of the bay were rough graded and then planted by volunteers. Everything else was graded to basically half an inch of precision um, and planted by the core. And this is kind of the scale of what we're talking about. So if those of you making marsh islands, you know, have no fear, you can do that. So essentially there's um, the, the construction, these are supposed to be those little you know, runnels that, of water that kind of come down the marsh, but the core draws them like sort of, you know, webbed feet. Um, but the scale of this is pretty enormous. So here's the drawing, and they're able to produce the exact same thing. It's kind of amazing. And they just use sand and bulldozers, so 
Um, and these little kind of kidney shapes are the, the high marsh areas where they're planting a little higher elevation species. Everything else is planted with Spartina, which is the existing species there. Um, we were interested in, in um, kind of thinking about like, well, when this happens, essentially what they have to do is they take away what's left of the kind of um, decomposing marsh. They rip out everything that's left. They regrade it, again, just to be at the correct elevation where anything planted there is tidally inundated twice a day. Um, and then they replant it with these uh, hassocks of, of um, Spartina. So we were thinking, could there be a better way that wasn't quite so muscular in its, and bra bravura in its attempt? Um, and we were interested in this kind of beginning phenomena, where here you can see the bulldozer are basically creating a, a containment dike into which they're then going to pump all of this dredged material. Um, we wanted to think about what if you just stopped there and thought about that as a sediment trap and use that as a way to use less of that precious dredged material, which is so, uh, in fact, valuable for ecological restoration. So instead of these quantities that you're seeing for these restorations, these massive numbers of cubic yards of sand, we would use smaller numbers to create slightly higher elevation um, terraces, which would be just above the high tide line and planted with the high marsh species, but then would act as sand traps for sand moving throughout the bay to depose in that very precise area in the water column where low marsh occurs. It's between essentially the mean tide and the high tide. So we looked at the bathymetry or the topography of the bottom of the bay. This is like the bay with all the water vacuumed out. This is the kind of topo lines below. Um, and we thought about how we could essentially bring up those um, edges of the marsh as incomplete forms to create these catcher's mitts of essentially um, rings of sand traps that would allow um, current and water laden with sediment to slow down and to run up onto the surface of the marsh, in fact, depose the sediment onto the marsh, allowing it to accrete upward, uh, essentially giving the marsh a way to keep up with sea level rise on its own through a less heavy-handed restoration process. So essentially, we're creating a four-foot terrace. Um, our high tide is right around three feet. This is above, you know, using this reference, NAVD 88 for our zero mean tide. Um, and essentially thinking about that as a way to restore the entire marsh platform rather than one island at a time, project-based in the kind of traditional core fashion. So that would allow for a much more robust um, process of restoration to begin throughout the, the bay. Um, for, I'm going to zoom you into Little Egg Marsh, which is in the southern part of the bay. Um, here you can see the rendering of that marsh with the, the terraces at the edges, again, just bringing them slightly up. And the key thing here is this section through the terrace. Um, essentially, it's a steeper gradients on the side of the kind of bay side and the island side or the inside of the island is a, a, a shallower, more gradual gradient slope so that if you have run up, it's slowing that water down so that you can get the deposition within that shallower slope for the Spartina to take hold. And of course, the species that are planted on the high marsh are those that are basically working within the high marsh range. And this is a very long section taken through the marsh island. Um, and here you can see the very minimal um, marsh terrace occurring there. Um, this is a part, this is actually dredged material that's been dumped there from the 1930s. So there's actually some high, some uh, maritime forest even on this little egg marsh. Um, very quite novel systems out here in the bay. So again, the digital elevation model with the adaptations of our proposal in here. So you're seeing again, the whiter is higher elevation. So just barely out of the tide line are these um, terraces. And this is, again, a surge, a simulation of water just moving in diurnal cycles um, through the bay and being caught by those, um, those terraces uh, that wrap the perimeters, perimeter footprints of the marshes. So again, the digital elevation models are really critical to our work. These are, DEM is not the, uh, you know, Will told me about it today. It's the Department of Environmental Management. Here it's a digital elevation model, so that's why I got confused. But this is essentially, a, 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 essentially these x-rays are showing us what we've done. We've merged together two sets of data, one from NOAA, one from USGS, to create a continuous surface, which are actually quite difficult to, to um, obtain. They're called topobathies, or topographies plus bathymetries, and we create the seam and readjust the datums of those two data sets to create a continuous surface, and then we go in and pot, plot points to create a kind of smoother um, gradient all of the edges between the two data sets. Um, so this is then modifying that data, that data over time, how we would be changing the topography. So this is over three phases. You can just, I'll go, take you back to nothing, and this is the, where we begin, and then we slowly bring up those marsh terraces as well as taking out some of these areas where we're looking at overwash, and then the raising of this um, protection for the communities at the back of the bay over, over um, a period of time. We basically phase this out to 2090. 
Um, and in addition to the work with the design and the elevation um, transformations, we were looking at um, data that was being developed at Princeton at the same time as our grant, looking at new ways of modeling hurricanes by using synthetic storms and running lots of them um, digitally through the system. Um, so the Princeton scientists were able to give us data points of slosh cells. So essentially, uh, we used um, slosh as a model, and essentially we had a point elevation for every storm condition, um, looking at various storm frequencies and over time with sea level embedded. So we were able to take those points, produce a surface, and then essentially smush our DEM into that surface to see what would be wet. So essentially, this is the slosh inundation map produced um, at the kind of existing current conditions. And we created a matrix of both time and return period of storm. So this is like a one-year storm sort of current time looking to a 2,500-year storm in 2090. So starting to see how over both time and types of storm events, we could start to start predicting where the extent of flooding might be. Um, and then we were also able to take those existing conditions and compare them to our proposals. So here's a 100-year flood, 2055. This is with our proposed interventions, including that um, the verge enhancement at the Belt Parkway, and you can see the extent of flooding that would be reduced um, given that, but also that more, in fact, you would get more water moving across areas of the peninsula. And that we see is a, a healthy way of keeping that water circulation process and the flow uh, working well in the bay. And we could do that with our, our imagery for any, basically any one of those um, points on the map, but also looking specifically at particular neighborhoods in more detail. So this is 105 100 before and after the interventions. So it was a very interesting way to think about how one could start to evaluate the um, outcomes of the design proposals against um, real data that's being produced quite uh, recently. So essentially, that gives you a, a bit of where we went with the kind of full idea. But just to bring you back to the Army Corps, with whom we met monthly, and they were, in fact, quite open. The New York District has a quite progressive team. Uh, working there. So in fact, it was great to work with them and they enjoyed working with us as well. And I think one of the things that we both gained was this whole idea that you could start to transform thinking from um, projects or just one at a time, um, but how they work as a suite. So essentially, you could start thinking about the core projects as things that start to help each other. So it's a, it's a whole series of lines of protection that are cumulative. Um, so if you're looking at protecting people in Howard Beach, restoration of salt marsh actually matters because that's part of the, the attenuation of waves as they start to run up to this neighborhood. Um, and so it's great. These are Army Corps slides. It was great to see this idea. And they were starting to catalog what are all the projects that are happening and how do they all work together um, more systemically and comprehensively, which they had not really done before. Um, the other exciting thing is they were very, they're very compelled by the Atoll Terrace ideas, and they're actually going to construct one right here as part of their pilot, where they're starting to look at filling the space between those two marshes, which used to be one contiguous marsh island, elders east and west. So they'll be constructing one of those terraces here as a full-scale pilot, which is very exciting. So this one right here is to come. Um, and the other kind of um, you know, policy impact that we've had on some of this thinking is in the Corps' assessment of, based on a cost-benefit analysis, which is how they decide what's right, um, of two different proposals for how to protect the bay. Um, one was the, what they called the perimeter plan, this red line, which is very similar to what we were looking at as part of the back bay protection along the Belt Parkway. Um, they had more of an idea of a seawall, but in fact we were thinking that this actually makes a lot of sense because you can build incrementally and protect a neighborhood um, very directly uh, and also provide a benefit in terms of open space um, and new um, uh, environments nearby the neighborhood. Or the other alternative was to look at this idea of the storm surge barrier, which we saw in 64 and then we saw again in 2012. So they started looking more closely at those two systems. So again, here's our Belt Parkway um, verge enhancement, very similar. And then uh, this discussion has been very much about the inlet barrier. And just a couple of weeks ago, the Corps announced that their preferred alternative based on their analysis is the barrier. So they're starting to think about um, actually implementing this. And so we are thinking about, in fact, maybe this is not environmentally the best preferred alternative. Certainly when you think about these alignments, so the purple line, which crosses at Gil Hodges Bridge um, from Floyd Bennett Field to the Rockaway Peninsula is in fact the longest because you have to continue that high ground elevation of the barrier until you reach high ground elsewhere in order to be continuous protection because otherwise if there's a break in the kind of dike that it will flood at that weak point. So they were looking at various alignments 
Um, and we brought to their attention, in fact, the scale of what they were proposing was twice as big as the largest moving structure in the world currently, which is the Mas Maslant Curling Flood Barrier, which is very near Rotterdam in Holland. These are swinging gates. It's a surge barrier where the gates swing close and then drop into the water to prevent surge reaching Rotterdam. Um, and you can see that opening is less than half of the width of the opening of the full Rockaway Inlet. Um, here's the one in, uh, outside of London on the Thames. And again, these are very tiny by comparison. So the Corps' proposal is actually pr proposing to bring it to, to create continuous and constant closure of the bay to reduce the opening until there's only a third of the initial width still remaining open, and that would be closed by gates. And so we are certain that the quality of you know, the water quality impact would be quite great. Um, so this is an ongoing discussion and assessment between the, with CORE and with uh, the New York State right now. And of course, some of the work we've been doing with Spring Creek, um, drawing on some early restoration drawings from the CORE, but also this is really starting to happen quite soon, in fact. So it's good to see that some of the work is actually starting to feed into real projects at massive scale that are about resiliency at the scale of the city. But since we're in school, um, we actually had a lot of fun, and I wanted to leave you with this, which is really thinking about what do you do when you do research. In fact, often all of the things you collect, and I'm sure in studios you've gone through this many times, a lot of stuff gets kind of pushed to the side as you kind of go towards your end product. So we had collected and amassed so much data and imagery um, and field trips we had done and old photographs we found, old aerial images. Um, thinking about patents, a kind of record of the Army Corps' restoration. So we, we created this format of the pamphlet, essentially a 36-page uh, hard copy pamphlet, to dump all our data. So we would basically leave something for other people potentially to work at or look at. So we created these 16 pamphlets. Um, they're both physical books, but they're also digitally online. You can look at any of them on our SCR website. Um, so, you know, it includes the usual things, such as the kind of final report that has all of the data and information. but other things where we started to think about what are all the plants that work in this bay, what has been used by the Corps and the Parks Department and the, and the um, National Parks as part of their approved plants for restoration. And so we started to catalog, we created a plant catalog that looks by um, elevation, essentially what plants would do well where. So we start with our low salt marsh where we have just one species and we move our way up through the entire um, gradient until the coastal forest. So essentially this was a very nice way of thinking about who's on which plant list, uh, what's involved and what can be used in these various spaces. Um, you saw an image similar to this. We essentially went through a lot of archived um, NOAA maps to think about the evolution of the edges of Jamaica Bay and how they've changed over time. Um, so this booklet really looks at all of those tracings and overlays over time. We didn't look at every single map, but we looked where important things changed when suddenly a dredge island appeared or an airport appeared. Um, and there was a radical transformation to the edges. We also looked at where things were dredged, which was quite interesting to see how the channels for shipping evolved within the Back Bay as well. Um, Artifacts was a fun one. We went out to the bay a lot, and you find a lot of weird stuff on these beaches in New York. This is actually a kind of popped landfill. It's called um, Dead Horse Bay, but often it goes by Bottle Beach, because essentially there, this was everyone who was evicted from Barren Island before it became... Um, part of the airport for Floyd Bennett Field, that first airport. So um, a lot of people were evicted from their homes. Everything was basically trashed, put in a landfill, capped badly, and left. So there's an incredible amount of kind of amazingly beautiful garbage, or as National Parks would say, cultural artifacts. Um, so these cultural artifacts can be found on those beaches, and they're quite, it's a lot of fun to go and find these things. Um, and think about those times. Um, another pamphlet's just looking at, it's basically our collection of aerial imagery of the bay from um, historical imagery to these important ones where in fact there's a kind of documenting by New York State of the, the uh, 1974 map of the wetlands, which is still used today for restoration. That's the footprint to which they are allowed to restore the marsh. Um, and more recent things where we start to see um, through aerial imagery, the, the reconstruction of some of these marshes by the Army Corps. So you can he see here the loss of Elders East and West, how they were once one island, and then the t double island created by the Corps, the beginnings of the fill for um, Yellow Bar, um, and the kind of continuation of that. So we have a kind of collection of that, as well as our, our, dread, our drone in imagery, which was quite interesting. This is a breach at the wildlife refuge in the middle of the bay that was caused by Sandy. Um, so Tyler went out here and stood out here and basically got some pretty amazing images of the bay from above. 
uh, real-time data. So, and, and again, another thing we thought about, um, this is a fun one, thinking about um, coastal structures. So we were thinking about this idea of the NNBF, or the natural and nature-based features that the Corps does, and we looked back into the record of American patents, like who designed what, and what were some of the, were some of these things sort of NNBF-y, meaning did they have a kind of combined soft hard profile? So we found some really interesting jetty designs in the patents. They're really fun to read. Like my invention consists of so it's very kind of narrative descriptions of these various um, ideas, and we compared that with some of the kind of typical CEM coastal engineering manual um, sections of the Army Corps, which are essentially a design section, highly refined, that's then extruded for as far as they have to along the coastline. So it's really interesting to think about these different thought processes over time and how natural systems might be involved in those. Um, this book looks at the cata catalog of the various marsh restorations the Corps has done. They didn't have this, so we, had, we wanted to think about what were the lessons learned, how much did each one cost, how can we compare them, and think about what one could do better the next time around. So this was a very helpful thing that they, they, they redlined for us and they made corrections to everything. So we have a really good record of what they have done. Um, within the bay. Again, this is the yellow bar hassock restoration. And then, of course, all of the data imagery for um, the climate projections and designs. We also combined that with some wind fetch analyses that looked at how our marsh terraces would start to reduce fetch, which is that um, distance over open water along which waves generate. So the longer the fetch, the higher the waves. And so by reducing the fetch through the terraces, we actually get much less impact of fetch um, and erosion on the shorelines of places like Howard Beach and Broad Channel. And again, this has all of those uh, maps in both details, how we made the maps. So also a kind of record for ourselves of our processes and um, the work that we did. Um, and then uh, to leave you with the last two, I think the, you know, where I started in the beginning a little bit too is we really wanted to think about the bay as a kind of very complex system that was like three-dimensional. It wasn't really just a surface of water and where it met the land, but rather um, the air above the bay and also that water below the bay. So we wanted to think about this thing as a volume, both the air and the water as well. And the airspace, in fact, is really quite contested. So um, that air above Jamaica Bay is, in fact, all part of FAA-regulated airspace because of JFK Airport, which, of course, is right there. Um, and there have been a number of studies, and often there's always a proposal for a new runway. Um, these are some great images from the 70s looking at noise impact from those runways on the neighborhood and the bay. Um, but we were looking, so here's the, the airspace maps look like this. They're kind of crazy, and we, tr we drew it in sections to understand it. It's a good thing to do with sections. But essentially, if this is the bay surface, um, it's basically an upside-down wedding cake. So all of this is air, air, regulated airspace to different degrees. Um, and you can see, essentially, here's the bay hidden within those circles, and the entire bay is within airspace. And then, of course, here's the flight patterns across the bay um, from JFK. Um, but I don't know if you all remember, in 2009, there was a famous Captain Sully who flew his plane out of JFK, and he struck a couple of geese, and he ditched his plane. I never had used, didn't know how to use that verb, but he ditched the plane in the Hudson River, and everybody survived. Everyone got off, walked onto the wing, got onto boats, and made it. So ditching means to basically land your plane in a body of water when you are in an emergency. So they lost an engine. He brought it down. And of course, this idea of the, um, the problem of the... Um, the airstrike and um, birds became, you know, quite uh, well known. Of course, they've been known before, but there's an interesting thing with the Port Authority that regulates the airport, um, and of course, this nat this wildlife refuge in the bay and this incredible habitat of marsh islands for um, nesting species. Um, there is a pro a program at the airport called depredation, which means essentially killing birds. So they have sharpshooters at JFK that take out birds. They destroy eggs. They have all of these ways of getting rid of birds, and they keep records. So these are all of the birds and their numbers who were killed in 2014. They killed a snowy white owl, and then the New York Post found out. So it was a huge, huge fiasco. But essentially, you can see there's thousands of birds that are being killed every year um, in order to protect the flights. And there's been a number of, of um, discussions at high level about is this the right thing to do. And um, lastly, I'll leave you with the bottom of the bay. So another pretty good um, data dump we got from national parks was some um, bathymetric scans. There was a professor from Stony Brook who went and essentially uh, took his whaler out in the bay with a sonar device, and he collected the bathymetry data from below the bay. Um, and it's actually really quite beautiful. You can see where his boat went at two different resolutions, one meter and five meter. 
And then the other amazing thing that came along with that data were these um, sediment grabs that he took at certain points around the bay. And along with the sediment grab, he also dropped down a camera and took some video at all of these different points. So we were given all of this data. We were actually able to take the data points um, of the collection points and rectify them back to the map and geospatialize them so we knew how deep that water was where they dropped the camera. So we could actually um, essentially uh, create a way of ordering all those images with depth. So everything in this top column is five feet deep water, six feet deep water. And it was fabulous to see um, at these various stations where they're dropping the cameras the variety of life down there or lack of life when you start to get in some of those very, very deep areas which have been dredged over time um, and that can no longer almost support life because of the lack of oxygen that's in that deep, deep water. So now we're down at 42 feet. Um, and I will leave you with a little video um, that we call the best of the bottom where we tried to get some of the greatest views and splice them together. So you start to see all these guys down in the bottom of the bay um, investigating the camera and the boat is rocking, so if you're seasick, you can look away for a minute and then come back. Um, that sea lettuce, which usually means the, uh, there's too much nitrogen, but there's also a nice hermit crab in this picture. Do you see him? Yeah. Whoa. This is a, oh, I'm not going to give it away. He's trying to hide. Let's see. There were a lot of waves that day. <laughs> you can see. This one's really right. More sea lettuce, never a good sign. Um, but also all these little periwinkle snails. And then as you start to get very deep and you need a light, you start to see things that I can't identify. So Maybe the folks at Sea Grant can ID this for us. I'm not quite sure what it, for a while I thought it didn't even move. Some of it actually kind of moves a little bit. You can see some movement. But uh, these are the deepest areas. This is the area that was dredged to produce um, enough sand to fill the wetlands that were, that are now JFK Airport. So very, very deep, 40-foot um, depths of what were once probably, it was called Grassy Bay, so obviously a very shallow um, bay environment best of the bottom. And I'll leave you with a, a great image that influenced our color palette from the very beginning um, by Klaus Oldenburg, the artist who does those big stuffed hot dogs and things. But he made this great little kind of three by five um, drawing that he called Proposal to Beautify Jamaica Bay. And we loved the idea that there could be, this place was beautiful and that in fact um, we could make a proposal to do that too. Uh, he did it with nail polish, which I think is really kind of great. From 1965, just the year after the Army Corps did their flood protection plan. So a nice way to end. All right, thank you so much. I really appreciated the invitation to come and speak with you. And happy to take any questions if you have them, too. Yes? Um, I actually have a question. Are you guys involved in any of the other projects that are going on right now in New York City and around surrounding New York City? I know uh, there's a couple. I live on Long Island. So. Okay, yeah. I, I mean, we're really working mostly in Jamaica Bay right now. Of course, we're aware of the projects going on, so Escapes Project for Breakwaters. Um, a number of the RBD designs were funded meaning that those designers don't get anything, but essentially an RFP goes out and a big engineering firm gets contracted. So at the moment, that's what's happening with the East River project as well, which was once the big U, which was the, the, um, the big proposal. Um, Star White House was the, arch the landscape architect as part of that team as well. We're not working specifically on those. We've done a pilot study for Port Authority to look at Red Hook as well and looking at coastal protection for that neighborhood of Brooklyn. But there's a number of things going on, but nothing's happening. I know. And we're three years out, so three plus. So we're all waiting. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah we're waiting for another storm in the night. It'll happen, yeah. <laughs> Lest we forget. Yes? Uh, so um, those, are, those are quite um, amazing images, drawings, sections, um, studies over time. Who did it? How many people did okay. it? How long did it take? I love that question because the answer is so unbelievable. It was me, Kirsten Alexander, who graduated in 2012 from City College, um, Danae Alessi, graduated in 2013 from City College, and Eli Sands, who was at that time a student in the third year. So the four of us. We were a four-person team, um, everybody pretty young and recently out of school, exception of me. Yeah, 
So, you know, and we got a studio, so we had a studio room at City College where we parked with our computers and built all our models and got water, <coughs> blue, blue food coloring water everywhere. Um, and we went out to the bay quite a bit to do field verification. Uh, we made friends with people throughout all of the parties that are interested. So it was great to engage with both the, um, the <coughs> advocacy groups um, in Broad Channel, as well as the Army Corps and National Parks, DEP and DEC, those are our Devi Department of Environmental Protection and uh, Conservation for the city and state, respectively. Um, so we basically were talking to everyone and trying to figure out what is it that Jamaica Bay needs, because everybody has a different opinion, so you really do have to talk to everyone. So, um, but yeah, the, we were a four-person team, which meant we could fit on the boat really easily when we went out with Rife. <coughs> yes? It kind of make you, it make you feel a little better about the birds that gave their lines. Yeah. Uh, uh, in most cases, the FAA collects them for their research on the ability of jet engines to withstand bird strikes. So the birds are collected, frozen, and saved for research where they are shot into jet engines wow. at a later time. Like frozen to ducks. See if, uh, well, they tried to defrost them first. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, so they gave their lives for time, basically. Okay. <laughs> I'm trying to decide if I feel better. Yeah, you know, <laughs> or worse. If, if you flew here on an airplane, you would understand. Yeah, that apparently, the yeah, there are a lot of interesting studies going on. So some of the, um, the work being done now, and I think this is done in Europe, there's some laser work that's done to deflect the birds so that the birds don't strike the planes. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a little less, imp low, lower impact strategy. Yeah. Uh, and then there's some really interesting behavioral works, almost sociological, that um, JFK is doing. And that involves um, training the cab drivers not to leave their sandwich wrappers outside of the cab, but to pack their garbage. It's kind of like a National Parks thing. Yeah. Um, so essentially, that's also attracting birds directly to the airport where the people are instead of staying out in the marshes. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it's a complicated issue. Very, yeah. very complex when you have these. And it it's really is kind of the, um, the biggest um, sort of like the ideal way of describing the conflict of nature and culture in a place like Jamaica Bay, which is also what makes that place so fascinating. We tend to build our airports. They exactly, they're, they're very flat. Wow. Yeah, yeah. It's not the only place with that yeah. condition. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yes? What's the time frame you expect these sea resources um, structures to fill in the sand? You know, that's a really good question, and we don't know, which is why I'm advocating for a full-scale pilot. Um, the the mapping or the understanding of sediment movement in the bay is not at all understood. Um, water quality is pretty well mapped, and there's good data on that. Um, we, we obviously, we have relatively good bathymetry studies, but the sediment element, which is one of the most complex things, like how does sediment move in the water column and when and why does it depose onto the bottom, is not studied. So in many cases, any kind of digital modeling that might show you like how far does the surge go under this condition, those models always take information out to be more, you know, flexible and adapt and runnable, in fact, because it can get, be very powerful, um, heavy models to run to simulate. And every time you take things away, you're actually losing things that you don't quite understand. So something full scale makes a lot more sense. Um, the question of the sediment in Jamaica Bay is also a really interesting one. Is it sediment starved or not? And again, depending on who you ask and what their values are, you get different answers. So that's also not very well understood. So we don't know if um, the terrace, um, we think it would work. We, we've looked at the way water circulates within the bay, and we understand how things slow down. And we know that when, when water slows down, the sediment deposits. The question is, is there enough sediment in the bay water now to allow for enough sedimentation for the marsh to accrete sufficiently to even keep up with sea level rise or not? Um, some other questions are, if we open up some of these um, flow paths across the barrier island at the ocean side, would that allow more sediment to come into the bay, which is our theory. Again, that's usually how those systems work when they, when they, um, when they are impacted by disturbance events. Um, and then I think the last thing is to really think about um, if that works, is there too much, because you know, marsh is complex, it has both organic and mineral parts, so the organic stuff comes from the marsh grass is actually dying and decomposing in place, so that adds to the accretion element. And you have to have the right balance between organic and mineral. You don't want like a 100% sand marsh. You actually need the kind of combination of plant life. So we don't know if, if, if you just built terraces, would that be enough to trap sediment and allow the marsh to go up, or would you have to kind of do a sort of sand 
engine thing where you'd bring sediment to the bay and let it disperse naturally? Or would you target it and actually put some on the marsh? It's, it, there's a lot of questions. So yeah, we're hoping that you know there's an engineering pilot out there for the Army Corps' um, Arctic <coughs> group in Vicksburg to study. Yes? I was wondering about uh, the marshes, uh, marsh migration and everything. We do a lot of work with that around yeah. here. Uh, we did a project with the, <coughs> with the uh, Salt Pond Coalition who was uh, dredging uh, you know, a breachway, right. and they had a lot of sediment there. Um, and part of, the, part of the project was you know, to look at the marshes and how do you distribute that, that material. And I think you, you probably answered, uh, you brought forth the, the big question that I had was, is that material adequate does right. it have enough organic matter in it mm -hmm. to uh, include, you know, the detritus that a, a marsh would produce, and um, and you know, and then they spray it across yeah. the marsh here to try to keep up with uh, sea level rise. Yeah. And we've got a couple of projects here mm -hmm. in the state that they're actually trying to distribute, um, you know, dredgings and uh, material on to try to keep up with that sea level rise. Yeah. Um, do you see that that? That's feasible or not yeah, feasible it's, or do you, you know, have questions? Again, there are so many projections of sea level rise and we look at an yeah. average in our data. Um, but in fact, I know here <laughs> in Rhode Island you use thin layer deposition, which has been proven in New Orleans as well in the Delta region to be pretty effective. Thin layer means that you basically rainbow it, so you get a pipe, like a six inch pipe or something, you, you basically make a rainbow of sediment and it spreads kind of thin across an existing marsh. The way the Corps did things in Jamaica Bay was they got rid of all that plant stuff that was in their way, and then they made their drawing on top of the footprint of the marsh. I know it's mind-boggling, but like that's how was, they what operate. What were they thinking? You know, <laughs> they're, they're challenged people. It's a really <laughs> challenged organization. They're trying really hard, and I think there's a paradigm shift underway. But it's like a well, big... keep up the good work. I know. I think we move the needle, like a tiny little bit, and like that gives me great hope. Um, but yes, it's, it seems like a flawed approach. Um, and then there's, you know, then there's like the thing that keeps you up late at night. It's like, oh, but is this, is this just life support for the marsh and, until then, you know, and then we're going to lose it. But, you know, the alternative is to do nothing. That is, a, that is an option mm -hmm. always for the Corps to do nothing. Um, and we know that if you do nothing and this reverts to open water, we'll never get it back. So you have to do something. So I think anything you do, thin layer deposition seems like a great Thing, although it does sort of seem like you're borrowing from your own eroding marshes at some points, um, or you know, basically kind of refeed, rejigging the, the puzzle. Uh, there's more active restorations, like the heavy-handed core stuff. There's the kind of medium ground where we're going with the terraces, which have been explored a little bit in the western marshes of Louisiana, those funny chevron shapes that they're yeah. doing. Um, yeah, so I mean, I feel like do nothing is not a possible, it's not a preferred alternative. So I think doing something is always better than doing nothing sure. in this case. But you're right, we don't know. Marshes are so complex, like plants who have no brain and they can't even walk around, they're so smart. Like they know how to go to the intertidal zone. They know how to migrate. Like these islands have nowhere to go but up. So that's the, the kind of marsh migration has to happen somehow upward instead of landward. So. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Well, <coughs> there are no additional questions. I think that Catherine is still going to be around if you want to ask her something individually. Otherwise, I want to thank you very much for a very stimulating. Thank you. Thanks.